Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kelly DeVere. I'm the Product and Marketing Manager at Plant Products uh, based at Leamington, Ontario. Uh, thank you all for joining us on a beautiful Thursday uh, morning. Hopefully you guys are having a coffee break or lunch and can sit with us for half an hour to get a little bit update on uh, Max Dima. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Brad Ayo. He's the Canadian uh, Business Manager for uh, Specialty um based uh, north of toronto so i'll let brad uh, introduce our uh, guest for today uh dr rick latin sure great thanks everyone it's uh a little bit unprecedented usually we try to uh, at these seminars try to see each other but uh with what's going on today and because you're so busy uh we're going to try to do this short and sweet and so you get the information in and out um we realize so thanks for taking the time. We know that uh, time is short these days. You're doing more than one job, you got short staff, and you're trying to get the most out of your IPM pro uh, program. And so what we wanna do is give you a little bit of a refresher on Maxima to show how you can use that to save money on your golf course and, 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 create, and save time and hassles for yourself on the golf course. Because Maxima is turf safe, it has long longevity or long residual, it has high rankings on anthracnose. Uh, early indications indicate that it's good on, on insensitive, uh, fungicide insensitive um, pathogens because of its good binding power. And lastly, but not least, it's very affordable. And so since the beginning of the year, since our registration, we've been uh, really clear about some of these things. And we've brought in numerous independent researchers to talk about Maxima because you know what the data speaks for itself uh, earlier in the year Dr. Latin came to the CGSA in Ottawa event and talked a little bit about Maxima um, Dr. Clark talked uh, came through on a road show earlier in the year just before this COVID situation happened and talked a lot about anthracnose plus other things and now we have again Dr. Latin. And so we've been able to bring out some of the predominant researchers in turf to talk that are independent who are wanting to talk about Maxima and, and their experiences with it over the last five years that the, this, this testing has been in place. So it's great for me to introduce Dr. Latin today. <laughs> He's a retired professor of plant pathology. <laughs> excuse me, at Purdue University, where he served on the faculty for more than 37 years. Dr. Lawton's research focused on turf disease control and factors that influence fungicide performance. In 2018, Dr. Lawton was honored with the, CGS, or the GCSAA, Colonel John Morley Distinguished Career Award for Distinguished Service to the Turf Industry. In addition to participating in local and regional events, in conferences in the United States and Canada, Dr. Latin has lectured in Europe and Asia on the principles of fungicide action on turf. The second edition of his textbook, A Practical Duck Guide to Turf Grass Fungicides, will be available in late 2020. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Latin. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Latin. Thank you, Brad. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to do this. Um, uh, so today, uh, you know, I guess I don't need to reintroduce myself. Emeritus professor means I'm retired. 37 years. Um, uh, during the past, last 25, I worked uh, strictly on turf grass diseases and uh, interested in fungicides, how they work, why they work, and sometimes why they don't work. We had an excellent resources from a laboratory perspective and from a field perspective where we could uh, address uh, real world problems and try to find some solutions to that uh, uh, to uh, reduce the, the effects of disease. Um, so I retired from Purdue, that's my campus there on the left, and uh, moved to Pinehurst, North Carolina. And uh, right now I just uh, serve as a consultant really uh, to academia and to uh, the turf grass industry on issues regarding fungicides. So today, what I'd like to do is share with you my experience with this new fungicide called Maxtima. Um, it's something that uh, entered my research program back in 2013 as a numbered compound. 
In fact, all the fungicides that you use, uh, I probably have seen over the past 20 years first as numbered compounds. And uh, uh, those that have the most promise continue in our programs and eventually get a name. And so that, that's what happened with Maxtima. All of us who uh, were, um, were involved in the early research were immediately impressed with the efficacy of it and the fact that it has some uh, uh, safety factors when using this DMI in the heat of the summer. Um, I'm gonna review uh, the DMI fungicides first, talk about their strengths mostly, uh, and then get into uh, this particular DMI fungicide and share the experience, research experience with it and uh, to, to show you why I think that uh, this is a, a very effective product and something that you ought to consider as well. So without further ado there, I, I use this particular slide uh, as uh, just to show the timeline of active ingredient introductions in the US. And you know, we started back in 1917, and then uh, the other milestone that's really significant is 1972, when the US EPA banned the use of heavy metal pesticides. And so we lost our mercury and cadmium compounds and that provided incentive for the industry to create all kinds of the modern fungicides that we have now. Um, uh, with, each, with each introduction, we're learning more about how and why fungicides work. Um, I like to, to uh, think about these DMI fungicides um, in terms of uh, three generations. And this would be the first generation. And you, you're familiar with some of these, the propiconazole and the microbutanil or the banner and the eagle, phenaramol not used anymore. Then around 2000, we had another generation that came out, uh, different uh, efficacies and et cetera. And then here's the newest, this mefen trifluconazole, which is, I, I guess I would call a third generation because it has that improved efficacy and also has a, what I would consider a turf safety factor. All right, so DMIs, uh, uh, in this particular chart, I have what I call the spectrum of activity of turf grass fungicides. And um, um, up on top here, I have uh, turf diseases, and it's sort of an evolutionary hierarchy going across from lower order pathogens all the way up to the rust fungi, which are very high order, very advanced from an evolutionary standpoint. And these oh my seeds, they used to be called fungi, and now they're not, but we know them as pythium diseases and things like that. Then we have these ascomycetes and basidios. In red here, I have all of the diseases, really important diseases. I used to, when I was in uh, uh, at the university, I was in the Midwest, okay, in the lower Midwest. So we had all of these diseases uh, on bent grass and on our poa. And the, the ones that really caused the damage and really um, uh, required the attention of a fungicide were dollar spot anthracnose, uh, the microdochium, the pink snow mold, all of these root diseases, tiffia snow molds, and ferrium. And look at the DMIs. This is the, the spectrum of activity here. These DMI fungicides are so active against such a broad range of pathogens, and that's why they're so valuable. Now, in terms of mobility, if uh, what I have here is just a cross section of a leaf, and uh, here's our fungicide deposit, and of course we get a little bit of redistribution, and if this single deposit were allowed to sit there and we watched what happened with the active ingredient, we would see that it passively diffuses into the cuticle, past the epidermis, around some of these other cells, and hits the xylem and goes up. The diffusion here is very passive. Like I said, it requires no energy. It's very simple from high concentration to low concentration and just filters through the leaf, hits the xylem and goes up and out. Now, the xylem is uh, like uh, the capillaries in our fingers. So anywhere we would prick our finger, we would draw blood. Anywhere we would strike a leaf, we would contact xylem. So if a fungicide is xylem mobile, it moves with the water stream up through the plant and distributes that fungicide throughout. 
And if during that process, it makes contact with one of these active fungi, here's a, a mycelium growing in here, this little brown structure here I have, if it makes contact with that, it's going to stop its growth. And once it stops the growth, the infection stops, uh, turf recovers, and we get what we call disease control. One misnomer about DMI fungicides, because they're used successfully against many root diseases, uh, some assume that it must go down through the plant to the roots to address those. And not, that's not the case. DMIs only follow the water stream, they go up. So if we're addressing a root problem with a DMI fungicide, we have to get it off of the leaves and into the thatch, into that turf profile, so it can encounter the pathogenic fungi and be taken up by the roots where it needs to be. Very typical of modern, many modern fungicides are, are like this. Now, from a mode of action perspective, all DMIs block this compound called ergosterol, okay, ergosterol, which is really interesting, um, oh, yeah, interesting compound, um, uh, in that humans ha have no ergosterol or no need for it, and, and neither do livestock or pets, and no plants need ergosterol, okay? And so the point is, the only place in nature that ergosterol occurs is in the cell membranes of certain pathogenic fungi. It's pretty cool, okay? It's almost like a designer fungicide going against a, a, a target that is only found in fungi. That, that's why, uh, it, 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 from a human and environmental perspective, uh, the DMI fungicides have a great safety record. So here's this ergosterol that's assembled, it's biosynthesized, it's assembled inside the fungus from these sterile precursors or building blocks, right? And the key component is this demethylase enzyme, which assembles those building blocks and makes ergosterol. And if we use a DMI fungicide, it inhibits that and ergosterol is either eliminated or completely reduced or reduced drastically so that the membrane doesn't function. If the membrane doesn't function, no infection can occur. The fungus will actually begin to die and we get disease control, okay? So that's why they're called demethylase inhibitors. We also call them sterol inhibitors, the SIs, because they're inhibiting the production of this sterol, this ergosterol. Now, here are our modern fungicides, okay? And Maxtima is this mefen trifluconazole. You're familiar with all of these, okay? They all attack the same target, the same D demethylase enzyme target, okay? but they're different in efficacy. And from my perspective, that has a lot to do, maybe almost everything to do with the strength of binding of this active ingredient to the target site in the demethylase enzyme. So they differ in efficacy because of that. Now, I have one thing you probably haven't heard of this fluconazole. This is an interesting one. It's not used on turf or any plants. This is used in medicine, okay? If we have a dandruff problem or an athlete's foot problem and there are other problems caused by fungi in humans, we use a DMI fungicide. The, the, the DMI fungicide will be prescribed to address those, okay? Just, just giving you some, uh, an impression that these fungicides uh, have a very low uh, impact on, or side effect, what have you, on, on humans as well. If I were to rank the fungicides according to their ability to, con to control dollar spot, I rank them something like this. And I have this scale here on the left that goes from excellent all the way down to marginal or below. This is a relative scale. So anything up in this area here is going to be, regardless of, of uh, disease pressure, they're going to be among the very best you can do. And the top ones will do very well, even under high disease pressure. Now, as we go down here, we get down to this area here. And in this particular case, we have fungicides that uh, are not standalone dollar spot fungicides. And, uh, even under moderate disease pressure, uh, they uh, will, will be unsatisfactory by themselves. So we really don't consider these sort of things here. Maybe up in this area, and you can see where the DMIs, I placed the DMIs 
based on my 25 plus years experience with these, and this is how I would rank them. They're FRAC code three, important to know, because uh, when we when we develop our programs, we want to make sure we don't schedule the same FRAC code too often. So the Maxima, I would put at the top, it has this special efficacy. Again, I attribute it to binding string. Okay, still on mode of action here, and uh, this is a really interesting slide to me, and I hope people can understand and, and get as much out of it as I do. You know, when, when we look at fungicides, just the, the fungicide versus the fungus, a lot of times we just do it in the laboratory and we prepare culture plates with fungicide in them at different concentrations. And to do this, it's just like preparing jello. Okay, when we prepare jello at home, uh, we, we uh, take the powdered jello and we put it into the pot of boiling water and we, we, we dissolve the jello in there. And as it cools, we distribute it in containers and then we can enjoy it when it's cold. This these culture plates are prepared the same way, except it has no flavor in it. Okay, but what we can do is very precisely and accurately add fungicide to this jello before it cools, put them in the culture plates, and then take our pathogens and transfer them to the culture plates and see how they grow. Okay, so the fungus is that there's nothing involved in terms of. Uh, um, environmental factors or plant resistance factors or anything like that it's just the ability of the fung fungus to grow in the environment of the fungicide so here for example is it the dollar spot pathogen probably three days growth right with no fungicide it just covers that plate very quickly here's uh, the max tema and down here we have the banner max and a thousandth of a part per million, a hundredth of a part per million, a tenth, one part per million, and 10 parts per million. You see that there's some subtle differences there, but they, they have a very a significant contribution or consequence in terms of disease control. So let's look at, at this one here. This is the Max Tima at a hundredth of a part per million. And if you look at the diameter of this colony, it's so similar to this one here at a tenth. And if you look at this colony, it's so similar to this one here at one part per million. And the same thing here, right? In the 10 parts per million with the max team, absolutely no growth. This is a tenfold difference. This means this fungicide is like 10 times more effective in stopping the growth of the pathogen than this fungicide. It actually comes close to 10. It's not quite 10 when we consider all of the all of the replications. But you can see here, in terms of fungus versus fungicide, right? You can see that there's about a tenfold difference here. Right? So this is a, a, a very interesting laboratory assay. I make my students do this all the time. And I like to do this just to get the sort of intrinsic potency of these fungicides against some of these pathogens. Now, let's go to the field with that. This is 2019. This is actually my final experiment uh, at, at Purdue. There's a lot of things going on here. And so let me uh, take your attention to this area here with these green rectangles. These are simulated plots with dollar spot in it. The contrast with the tan versus the green, right? And this, for example, is a simulation of 24% of uh, this plot area is covered with dollar spot symptoms. And here's 1%, which is a lot. I mean, certainly unacceptable from your perspective and my perspective. Here's a half percent and here's 0.25%. And what we do is we have these laminated cards. We bring them to the field to make sure we're as accurate as possible in determining and evaluating and comparing these fungicides at this very low end or the amount of disease. Now, Back to this uh, chart right here. Uh, fungicides were applied twice. We're out in these plots. They're replicated. Uh, these are all bent grass. Fungicides were applied twice, once here on the 17th and another here on the 8th of July. 
three fungicides involved. Here's the Maxima, the Banner Max, and the Torque. Okay, this is Tebuconazole, very similar to what you have in uh, Mirage. Right? There are many products in the US with Tebuconazole as the active ingredient. And th this is one called Torque, which is very popular uh, in the Midwest. So here we have, uh, we evaluate, you know, spray it, and then we evaluate over time, maybe uh, at least seven days, maybe sometimes uh, uh, five days. So each one of these nodes is an evaluation. I'll just show you the torque here. You can follow this yellow line as three week, the interval ends, you can see the, the increase in the amount of disease to about 1%, which would be similar to that, which is totally unacceptable. We make a second application, the turf will recover, and then of course, as the, the fungicide uh, or the pathogen overcomes the fungicide, you can see it increases again. So 1% doesn't sound like a whole lot of disease, but it actually is from the compare perspective of comparing fungicide. So here's the Tebuconazole, here's the Banner Max, and here's the Max Tema. Similarly, pretty subtle differences here. Okay? They're all doing pretty good uh, uh, right after the spray. But what I want you to look at, and this is what impressed me about what I consider the efficacy and the binding strength of these three fungicides, or the binding strength of Max Team. The amount of active ingredient we used to create this green line here was 0.453 pounds, and doesn't, the units don't matter, pounds of active per acre. Okay? The Banner Max has one and a half times that. And with the, the torque, we had three times that, right? So uh, one and a half times more to get the control in the blue line, and then three times more, and we had the control here, okay? So with less active ingredient applied, we get greater levels of control. I attribute that to the superior binding strength. It, to me, uh, I can match that up very well with the slide that we saw previously in the culture plates. This is some of the anthracnose work, and maybe you're, you're familiar with this from uh, Bruce Clark. Uh, he publishes uh, the record each year, and I pulled the 2018 data out. They don't have the 2019 out yet. But uh, uh, here we have three fungicides, again, the same three, very popular in, in the U.S. right here. And then we're, we are evaluating this, or they, the Rutgers folks, are evaluating this over time, and you can see they made an evaluation on June 14th, June 24th, July 4th, etc. Uh, I always look at the no fungicide uh, plots first. I want to see what, where the disease pressure is. You know, is it increasing? Because we want to look and make our comparisons during an interval where disease pressure is increasing. That way, we can better understand what the fungicide is doing under those conditions. So uh, we can see several periods here. I like this July 4th to July 15th period. Okay, we have increasing uh, amounts of disease in this no fungicide plot. And if you look there, okay, you can see um, with the Max Tema, we had uh, pretty much no increase in disease over that 10 day period, right? But we had a six fold increase with the torque and an eight fold increase with the uh, Banner Max, right? All the time where we're having that kind of increase during the, uh, in the no fungicide plots. So this one's holding steady. This one had the disease increase and this one had the disease increase as well. Again, from my perspective, it's the efficacy, the binding strength of this fungicide that allows it to, to perform better than its competitors. Now, the other thing that you might notice about uh, this one, and, and uh, it's another unique property about this and caught our attention back in 2014 and 15 when we were applying it to POA. We're not seeing any of the thinning, bronzing, PGR effects with this active ingredient versus the more common ones that we've used. And uh, this is just a, a, uh, an example of our plots. Uh, here was the Max team, and these plots were, were uh, treated with Primo every seven days. 
This is the Max Tima plot, okay? And this one happened to be called uh, Headway, which is a combination of uh, azoxystrobin plus propiconazole, the uh, active ingredient in Banamax. And, you know, Banamax is a great fungicide, but it does have this issue, okay? Uh, in the heat of the summer with the thinning or the bronzing and uh, just doesn't allow the turf to, to recover to a, uh, um, uh, to a healthy condition under these uh, stressful summer conditions, whereas uh, we had no PGR, such PGR effects with the Max Team. Definitely something that we can add into our programs uh, in the heat of the summer against POA, where we were protecting against anthracnose. You know, with all fungicides, especially the DMIs, we need to, to consider such factors that influence fungicide performance. And I'm interested here about fungicide resistance, which is one of the main four main factors. <clears throat> and we're told, we're ta often taught about this, this um, phenomenon called cross resistance, okay? Since all of the fungicides within a class, and here we're talking about the DMI class, okay, attack the same target site, that demethylase enzyme, we would expect all of them, okay, to behave similarly in the face of a, an isolate or a, a population that is trending towards resistance. Okay, that's what I always taught as well. And we're starting to see subtle differences in this, maybe more than subtle differences. We see that with the SDHIs, and now we're seeing some differences in DMIs. Just like DMI fungicides differ in their efficacy against these diseases, okay, they also differ in their behavior in the face of a resistant isolate. Okay, so, so uh, here are all the DMI fungicides. You're familiar with that, and you're familiar with FRAC code three. And uh, uh, we would like to look, or I, we looked back in 2018, at how the fungicides would behave um, on an experimental site that was trending towards the DMI resistance. So I think we were uh, among the first to uh, demonstrate this in the field. Um, and so I want to share those, ex those results with you here. Very similar type of experiment before, uh, but this time the outbreak had already occurred when we put the fungicides down. It was one spray right here, okay, on day one. And the average amount of disease in those plots was 8%, okay, based on that card, right? So that's a lot of disease right here, right? It's a, it's, we're asking the fungicide to do a lot to control that disease and get turf recovery. So our results are, over time, we're evaluating every three or four days. Uh, start with the Zemplar here, which is an SDHI, top of the line fungicide against dollar spot. And you can see the, the steady decline here over the 14 day period of evaluation. So what we had here, we, we have a lot of disease. We have put the fungicide down. It stops new infections. It starts to uh, suppress uh, the infections that are already there. It allows the turf recovery. And so we get excellent recovery, even in 14 days from a situation that looked like that. And that's something you would never experience in your world, but in our experimental world, we do this all the time uh, uh, just to see how things would work. Where we used the Max Tima, we had a similar situation where we had uh, this line increasing, see this green line, in, or decreasing throughout. Okay, we actually got turf recovery over 14 days, the experimental site trending towards DMI resistance. It's stopping new infections. It's suppressing the infections that had already occurred to create that symptom, and it's allowing turf to recover. Now, here we had the Banner Max, and here we had the Tebuconazole or the Torque that we used. And as you can see, you know, uh, there might be a hint of, an, of a decrease, but really it stays very high and we hardly see anything at all. And the, the, the uh, uh, amount of disease increases. So the, the pathogen strain 
that is resistant is overwhelming this fungicide. It's not as effective anymore. And it's very similar with the Banner Max. Okay? So we found that here's a, here's a DMI fungicide with a superior binding strength, and we're able to include this okay, into our program okay, and, and, and get the control that we expect. Now, we don't expect, I'll say, maybe save this to the summary, but we don't expect you to use this over and over again. Uh, but here's a situation where we can reintroduce this uh, into a program and be confident about the level of control we will get. And again, it goes all the way back to the, um, uh, my initial thoughts on this, is that DMI fungicides are so valuable because they cover so many bases. And here's one base that we can cover again, even in the situation where we have some resistance. And we usually see this sort of thing in the Midwest, not on putting rings, but we see it uh, on fairways. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is just the label, um, what you can expect here. And uh, this is the Canadian uh, label to date, um, US labels over here. Um, I point out anthracnose is something, especially in the heat of the summer, it would be valuable against, uh, and of course, the dollar spot. And I notice here, take all patch, you have some data here on take all patch. These diseases here are all related. The, the pathogens are all related. Uh, here in North Carolina, we have an awful problem with spring dead spot, and Maxima works very well against that. Up in the Midwest, where I came from, uh, summer patch also has excellent control. So we would expect that uh, this label will expand eventually as more data will be uh, generated and you will see the max team used as an effective uh, root disease fun, uh, treatment as well. <clears throat> okay, so my summary slide here, we're coming up on, on 30 minutes here. Let me recap. Uh, DMI fungicides effective against many turf diseases. Very broad spectrum and very useful in the turf program. From my experience research in my lab and in my my uh, uh, field work, you know, I, I think that this particular active ingredient has a superior binding strength, and, and that's the the disease control quality that it has. Um, uh, I was going to say something else about that. Uh, despite the fact that all DMIs attack the same enzyme, uh, they differ, and I think this one has a superior efficacy. Uh, we talked about uh, where we have dollar spot resistance. It's a big issue in the Midwest, especially on fairways. Um, I've encountered many situations where supers would just give up on the DMIs. Um, or disease control uh, where resistance is starting to occur. And uh, I know that some supers have been able to reintroduce a DMI, this max team, and have very good results. And all I would do is caution against overusing this, right? No consecutive applications and, and uh, against the dollar spot. And I would be really careful and maybe limited to three applications or two strategic applications. Excellent fungicide. You can use it confidently, but don't overuse it because that's where we, how we got here uh, to begin with. And finally, I think this quality, uh, uh, the, that it doesn't have the, the PGR effects, would allow our superintendents in the, mess, in the Midwest to reintroduce this uh, where we have POA greens and anthracnose problems. Uh, without uh, any turf quality effects. So um, let me uh, stop right now. Let me uh, end the formal presentation, open it up and uh, uh, for discussion. Kelly, uh, I hope you'll be able to moderate this um, and um, I'll be able, if there are questions that come my way, I, I sure would like to address them. Yep, no, that's uh, great. Uh, Dr. Latin, uh, awesome presentation. Uh, a lot of good good info in there. Lots of great uh, graphics. Uh, I don't see any um, questions in the chat or anybody's hand raised, but that could just be because people are like me and don't know how to do it. Um, so I would say um, 
hopefully if I unmute everybody, it doesn't, it, I, I'll unmute everybody. If you have a question, please ask. If it gets to be too noisy, then um, I'll ask that, uh, that, we, that we try to do it through the chat or raise your hand. So I see if this works. Maybe. Uh, hmm. Okay, that didn't uh, go to plan. Uh, Tyler's unmuted. Oh, so I guess what this works is anybody on the call can unmute themselves now. That's what I've done. So if you have a question, uh, go to your uh, go to where you are on the screen, your name, or, or just sorry, uh, um, you can go on your uh, on your uh, on your uh, unmute, and you should be able to unmute your microphone now. Uh, okay, um, so I have a question. So uh, sure. question was the U.S. label rate for anthracnose is much different than the Canadian. Yeah, um, correct. And I'll let Brad uh, handle the rate issue. Uh, one thing I would say about about that is that um, with anthracnose, this is my personal uh, opinion and my experience with anthracnose in my research plots. I, I think you need to to tank mix if you're addressing anthracnose. And so uh, the, the low rate of the DMI will definitely help, okay? But I think you should have uh, a chlorothalonil in there as well. But Brad, you might want to speak to the to the rate issues with regard to that. Yeah, th thanks, Dr. Lydon. Um, yeah, the, the label is the label. We do have, like when this label was submitted, uh, we did show um, effectiveness of Maxima against anthracnose at those low rates. Um, the U.S. has moved up those rates to because they would like to see better control on that, and and we're working on improving the label as well. However, at this time, the the low rate is the only one we have available. Okay, and and um, that and and Kelly, that, that that would go for dollar spot too, right? So. That we only currently have the low U.S. rate for dollar spot. Um, they, for the full 28 days in the U.S., they suggest a, a 12 and a half. But again, the label is the label. You have to follow the label. Um, uh, and we're go working hard to try to change the label, uh, maybe for the even for the end of next year, or for the middle of next year. You know, I okay. might comment on that, Brad, if, yep. if that's okay. Is that uh, if if we're going after dollar spot on fairways with the low rate, I I, I would like to see you use a uh, you know a a contact fungicide along with it uh, because um, uh, I think low rates are um, the low rates can be effective, but not as effective and uh, as the higher rates and um, uh, Tank mixing with another one has a, a contact fungicide, whether it be chlorothalonil or the secure fluazinam, will always have a, a benefit. All right, good, good piece of information. Um, seen as, oh, there's two questions, but they were the same question. So uh, we answered, we killed two birds with one stone. Um, yeah. Uh, here or nothing, Mike, Jason, do you guys want to say anything? Uh, well, we got the crew on the road. I have uh, I have something I'll just uh, comment on for anybody interested as well. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources, but <clears throat> BSF was kind enough to get some small trial packs for us that we're gonna uh, go out and do some some testing with. Um, so we have uh, 600 and fill, 650 mil bottle. Um, and at that low rate, that 6.25 mils per 100 or 5.8 mils per 1,000, uh, we can treat about 112,000 square feet out of that bottle. Um, please speak to your rep and we'll make sure we bring a bottle over. We're looking to collect some data from it. We wanna show you what it can do and then hope, uh, hopefully we can um, 
earn your confidence and and uh, see uh, see it go down on your next app on fairways for for dollar spot and or in Thracknos. But uh, please talk to your rep and we'll do what we can to work through uh, some of that. We have limited supply, so I kind of hesitate whether I should have mentioned it on the call, but um, I did anyway. I think I think Jay makes a good point. I mean, we, we're trying to get you know we're, we want to collect data, but uh, these are situations with any new product. That I think everyone you know with the plant products and BSF, and, and and I think some of the researchers were excited with the data that came out with the development of this product, and um, you know that we we've done we did some trials uh, in in Canada uh, last season that had outstanding results, and uh, you know we're all pretty excited. So everyone should just um, you know at least try it this year and, and it's kind of eventually with any new product it's sort of see it for yourself but uh, i think we've got a lot of good information out there to just um give you guys another tool uh, uh to put in the arsenal for disease control and and like brad mentioned i think with things going on now that's that's cost effective um and economical for control so uh, we're excited just to get everyone to try it and and use it this year and, and uh you'll sort of see for all see for ourselves how uh, how this can help us moving forward. Great. All right. Well, I'll be on behalf of Plant Products and BSF, uh, thank you all for taking time out of your uh, probably really busy day today. And uh, we look forward to hopefully doing this uh, uh, again, but maybe this time, next time in person. So uh, have a great uh, weekend. It's only Thursday, but a great weekend. And uh, we hope to talk to you all soon. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.